I spoke to the butcher today and got the hanging weights for the lambs. The results are in. The butcher originally told me that the meat would be ready for pickup today, and I called him and spoke with him earlier, and he said that they still hadn't done the cutting on it yet, but he had the hanging weights for me. Hanging weight is their weight after they've been broken down to just a carcass. That's post evisceration, skinning, etc. But it's pre butchery, so that hanging weight is not necessarily all the weight of the meat. There's just naturally some loss with some of the bone that gets removed and some of the scraps. I'm really pleasantly surprised with the results. Starting with the biggest, which was black butt, he came in at 60 pounds hanging weight. White butt and number 53 came in just under black butt's weight, coming in at 58 pounds each. And the little guy finished at 38 pounds hanging weight. What a great bit of news to end the slaughtering and butchery process, man. That is just excellent. I was thinking I might get only 40 pounds on average from them, but at 60, 58, 58, and 38 pounds, I'm getting an average of 53 pounds per carcass. To me, that's just excellent for a 100% grass-fed and finished lamb that was mostly on hay with really poor pasture quality. They were katahdins and then katahdin crossed with dorper. These are not huge meat breeds. For us to get that result our first year, I'm just so excited. What you doing over there, little buddy? I'm just in into my store. In your store? Yeah. What kind of store is this? It's something that's kelp meal for you to buy. Kelp meal for me to buy? And yes, and then throw. No, we don't want to throw kelp meal. We don't want to waste it. What's that kelp meal for? Well, it's for animals to eat. It gives them a certain boost in nutrition, certain minerals that they need in their diet that, are, that they don't get from the grass. They get from the kelp meal. Oh. Do you want to buy some? Sure. How much is it? It costs $5. Which one, which one would you like? The one on the left. That's all I get for $5? Yes. Wow, that's really expensive kelp meal. Yes. It's time to do the math for all this now. I'm gonna analyze this in a couple different ways. One way, we're gonna look at it, keeping all the infrastructure out of the equation. We're gonna just look at the hard costs for the sheep. I'm gonna calculate the purchase price of the sheep, plus the cost of the hay, plus alfalfa pellets, and the minerals, which were kelp meal and salt. The input cost plus the butcher fees for two of the animals equaled $1,160.62. In this analysis, my cost per pound of meat raised was $5.42. This is a little higher than what I originally thought it would be because my butcher fees were a little bit higher and because I did not account for the minerals. The other analysis includes all the infrastructure. So all of my costs. But a fair way to include the infrastructure into the total costs is to amortize it over 10 years. I expect I will get more than 10 years out of this stuff, but that is a good conservative estimate as far as the lifespan of the equipment. Infrastructure costs include the energizer, two batteries, the polywire perimeter fencing and laneway system on reels, which also includes the cost of all the T-posts, step-in posts, T-post in insulators, and all the gate handles. Other infrastructure costs include the shelter, the portable electric fencing, and this corral made from the cattle panels. Now looking at the inputs plus the infrastructure amortized over 10 years, it brings the cost to $1307.62 or $6.11 per pound. So we have the cost at $1307. Now compare that against the income I made from the two lambs that I sold at $5 a pound was $480. And then the money I saved with the two lambs we kept by not buying them from the farmer we would have been at her price, we saved $961, which puts us ahead $134 despite all the expenses that went into this. Of course, this number does not include my time spent. However, I didn't spend any more time raising two additional sheep than I would have the two that we were keeping for ourselves already. Homestead success.
just a quick update on the carport. The contractors came on the day I went to the Farm and Food Expo, the Jill Salatin event, so I wasn't able to film any of the progress on it, but essentially they put up a lot of the trusses that they're making as well as the skip sheeting. They should finish the roofing their next time here, and then the following time they're gonna be putting up the pony wall that they're gonna build down the middle of this thing. What are you doing in there? You laying sitting on an egg. <laughs> A viewer from Lilac City Real Estate left a comment wondering if there were any other takeaways that I could share from the Joel Salatin workshop that I went to. There were a few things that set the light bulb off for me. I've heard and read a lot about uh, Joel Salatin's Raken House, which is a combination of rabbit and chicken house. But I've never seen it before. I never found any pictures of it until I attended this workshop. He showed some pictures of the inside. This chicken greenhouse is based on Joel Salatin's concept. He's using huge hoop houses to overwinter his layer chickens in and then using them for planting in the spring, getting early starts on vegetables. So we've copied that model and just really, really downsized it to this small homestead scale. But what I didn't realize is that he's using those same hoop houses for the raking house. So he has the rabbits and the chickens in the hoop house. Essentially he has the rabbit cages going around the perimeter of the hoop house above the ground. The droppings from the rabbits go to the ground where the chickens are and the chickens scratch and spread it all around. In other pictures that Joel shared of the chicken greenhouse in the workshop, the interior, he shows that he's actually using more vertical space in these things. He has these platforms on legs that run down the middle of the greenhouses, so they're not taking up any floor space, but it's adding another dimension. He's really taking advantage of vertical space in these things that the birds couldn't otherwise use. By adding another level, the birds get a lot more square footage that way. I recorded a lot of video while I was there, and I haven't even been able to go through a fraction of it yet. As I go through it and watch more of it in the next few weeks or months, when I come across some nuggets, I'll be sure to extract them and share them with you guys. Where's your favorite one? Do you see her? No. Over on this side. That's her, isn't it? Yes. Are you going to name her? Little Buddy has a question he wants to ask you guys. I need help naming my bull. Can you help me? Little Buddy is hoping that you guys can leave some name suggestions below in the comments. This is for the blue copper moran that he likes. And what we'll do is we'll read the suggestions to him and little buddy can pick which name he wants for her. Does that sound good? Yes, sure. 